So welcome again. Thank you. Uh, just a few housekeeping items before we get going. Um, our session will start with a presentation by Dr. Shankel, and then we will open it up to Q&A afterwards. Some of you have submitted questions already, so thank you to those of you who have. If any of you have questions that you would like Dr. Shankel to address during the Q&A session, please use the Q&A feature in Zoom. There should be a button at the bottom of your screen um, that will allow for that. And uh, we will, I will review those and raise them to Dr. Shankel at the end during the Q&A session. Um, and for anyone who isn't aware, we uh, are not showing the participants uh, on Zoom. So none of you can be seen on video and you cannot be heard either. So don't try screaming questions live. It won't work. Um, keep in mind that we might not get to all of your questions, but we'll try our best within the hour that we have allocated and maybe a little bit longer than that if Dr. Shankel is generous with his, his time. Um, okay, so that's all on that. And now for a really quick intro on our resident expert on cognition. Uh, Dr. Shankel is one of the country's leading experts on Alzheimer's and other age-related neurodegenerative conditions. He spent over three decades treating patients, fighting these diseases, conducting research to advance our knowledge of the brain and developing new treatments to delay or prevent the progression of cognitive impairment. In 1997, Dr. Shankel founded the Shankel Clinic, a neurology practice headquartered in Newport Beach, California, focused on the management and treatment of neurodegenerative conditions. Prior to founding the Shankel Clinic, Dr. Shankel served as the clinical director for the Alzheimer's Research Center at UC Irvine, which he co-founded. He also served as the director of the Memory and Cognitive Disorders Program at Hogue Neurosciences Institute. Currently, in addition to leading the Shankel Clinic, Dr. Shankel serves as the Chief Medical Officer for MBIC Corporation, and he is a Medical Director for the Orange County Vital Brain Aging Program. Tonight, Dr. Shankel is here to speak about his prevention practicum, which I know we're all very excited to hear about. And with that, I will turn things over to you, Dr. Shankel. I just asked you to unmute, but you might need to uh, unmute yourself. Okay, hey. perfect. Um, thank you very much, Connor. Uh, <clears throat> we've just uh, ending the long period of uh, COVID isolation, and uh, it's had a very significant impact on many people's lives. Um, we're now learning that there are two types of cognitive impairment from COVID. Uh, one affects young people and one affects older people. And it may even uh, initiate a neurodegenerative or a degenerative brain process. So I think it's particularly relevant uh, to also uh, consider it to be a risk factor that uh, we should uh, eventually address. And there are ways to do that. Um, what I'd like to talk to you tonight about is the, what I like to call the prevention practicum. It's time has come. It, it's really uh, been around for quite a while, but uh, it's not widely recognized. And so uh, without further ado, I hope this is going to show up. Can, is it okay, Connor? Can everybody see that? Not yet. I will let you know when we can. Okay, I just, uh, oh, I know I need to share the screen. That always helps. Okay, let's see now. This should work. Can you see the... There you go, yeah. Now I'm going to attempt to put this in play mode. Can you still... Perfect. Yay! Okay. Rock and roll. Here we go. So... Uh, the Shankel Clinic mission is really to develop a person-specific uh, method for preventing symptoms of degenerative brain diseases. Uh, remember that the majority of time, the period that there is a degenerative disease in the brain, it does not cause symptoms. Uh, in Alzheimer's, for example, 
it lasts for approximately um, 30 years out of its total um, 50, 50 or 50 to, or 40 to 50 year course with no functional impairment at all. So if we can identify these conditions while you are still functioning uh, independently, then you can go on to live uh, a normal life with a good quality functioning brain. And that's really, I wanna put myself out of business, basically. So uh, be aware that uh, cognitive decline doesn't mean you're getting something uh, like a degenerative brain disease. We know from longitudinal studies that once we hit 45 years old, that we do in fact see decline in many different abilities, cognitive abilities. I call them brain functional abilities. Uh, the ability to um, follow uh, a conversation, for example, uh, word retrieval, name retrieval, reading speed, attention, uh, even short-term memory, which is what Alzheimer's affects. And when I say short-term memory, I really mean the ability to recall something as little as a few minutes later to as long as two weeks later, because that's the period of time that the so-called short-term memory stores things. Uh, <clears throat> so you can see from this slide that, that there is a decline in all of these abilities except for things like story recall and vocabulary. They are much more robust. And uh, I'm very glad about that because uh, when I become a grandfather, I want to be able to tell all the stories to my grandchildren. Fascinatingly, if you keep your marbles, okay, um, wisdom continues to increase. And I, I find that really interesting. In other words, wisdom isn't just about cognitive function. It's a mixture of life experience, uh, intact cognition, uh, and other factors. So uh, the older we get, the more valuable we could become to society if we, if we thought about it from the perspective that wisdom is the kind of thing that makes societies better. Now, I don't think in many countries we consider uh, older people uh, as valuable resources. And yet, I think they can provide uh, solutions through their wisdom that we may not be considering and could benefit greatly from. So just keep in mind that just because it's more difficult to recall the name of somebody or it's more difficult to remember a recent event, that does occur with aging, it also occurs with disease. So we need a way to distinguish aging from disease, and that's part of the prevention practicum. In fact, we've known for quite a while, this was published uh, eight years ago, uh, the United Kingdom did a um, nationwide uh, assess epidemiological study, and what they found was that over the last uh, 20 years, there has been a 25% decrease in the prevalence of dementia at all ages uh, above um, 74 years old. So from 75 and above, uh, there was about a 25% reduction in the, percent, the prevalence of dementia. And uh, it's attributed to the improvement in lifelong learning, prevention strategies, and better medical treatment. So how do we prevent brain dysfunction? Well, I'm gonna give you a very uh, different perspective than I think you'll normally hear because uh, I wanna take it from the perspective that the human brain and the human body is a system and it's a system of parts that interact. And the parts are our organs. And 
if we understand the general properties of how systems work, that helps us understand how we can actually help our brain and body system to continue to work and not break down. So that's what we're going to discuss next. Now, I couldn't avoid this. I'm a mathematician at heart. And so this is the only math slide you'll ever see in this talk. And I'm going to break it down. A system, let's call it, give it the letter S, is composed of parts. And we'll call the parts Q with a little j. And let's say there are up to n parts. Well, it turns out that there are about 17 organs in your body. So we would say that the human brain and body have 17 parts. And as we get older, uh, we can consider that to be a change in our brain body system over time. And the change in that brain body system is a function of all the parts. And not only does the system, the brain system that generates brain function, not only does it depend upon the function of all its parts, it also means that the function of each part or each organ is a function of all the other organs. And I can tell you, uh, I'm, it might have changed. Uh, I went to medical school back in 1979 to 1983, so obviously things have changed. But uh, the way they teach medicine is organ by organ. We have cardiology, we have lungs, we have kidney specialists, we have hormone specialists, um, we have brain specialists, we have bone specialists. So that's a strategy that treats parts. It doesn't consider the whole body and brain as a system with interacting parts. And that's the approach that I think will be the most productive in preventing brain dysfunction. So this is basically how systems work. And here's a simple system with my mother as the model. Uh, you see her on the left-hand side with her walker. And we can consider that walker to be composed of parts. It's got a grip, a height adjuster, a brace, a glider, and a wheel. And if any of those parts don't work well, then the whole system doesn't work. The walker, you have to make adjustments to how to use it. Well, the brain also is composed of the system, and these are the parts of the brain. We won't go into a lot of detail, just to understand the idea that the brain is composed of parts that interact with each other. Now, if we look at the brain body system, we can break it down into um, the brain and the body. So I'm gonna just open this whole thing up. Okay, here we go. So one part of the brain body system is involved in regulating the system. And that involves the brain and the hormone systems. And what they do is process information from the environment outside us, as well as they take information from how all your organs are doing. And they take information from other parts of the brain. Then they integrate all this information together and they then send signals that monitor all the activity of your organs. They analyze, decide, plan, and execute what, how the brain is gonna respond to all this input. They also tell the hormone system what to do because the hormone system operates on a much longer time scale than the brain system. The brain system operates in real time, whereas hormones operate over weeks to months. And so if you wanna control the whole system, you need not only immediate control, but you need long-term control. And that's what the hormones are for. Now you also, all systems need energy. So you need a way of delivering 
the energy. I call that fuel delivery. And that involves the heart, the lung, and the blood vessel systems. And they uh, absorb oxygen, they pump blood through the blood vessels, they deliver the blood or the fuel to the organs. Um, well, you also need a way of um, producing that fuel, and you need a way of getting rid of any waste products from the fuel. So you've got a gut, you've got a liver, and um, a couple of other uh, smaller organs. They absorb your essential nutrients. They uh, convert food down to the elements that the brain and body need, proteins, carbohydrates, and fat. And the gut el eliminates toxic and undesirable elements. Well, uh, that's great for the, for the intake of the food, but what about the stuff that's in the blood? What if you get toxic uh, chemicals in the blood? Well, you need something to detoxify the blood, which is basically carrying all the fuel and delivering it to all the organs. So we have kidneys and the kidney system, it removes uh, excessive water and different ions like sodium and potassium uh, to keep a balance of the concentration of them in the blood. Because uh, remember that uh, nerve cells, which are present in every organ in your body, they need a certain level of sodium and potassium to generate a signal. So they need a reliable uh, environment of uh, fluid around it in order to generate their electrical signals and the kidney helps provide that. Uh, the kidney also removes toxins in the blood and uh, the, the balancing of the ion environment in the blood, the sodium and the potassium and others is called homeostasis, keeping things the same. So you can see that we've got a system that has to um, uh, generate food, generate fuel, deliver it, uh, get rid of waste products and maintain a stable um, uh, blood environment for all of your organs to work properly. Well, you also need um, defense from the environment. And so we've got skin and we've got an immune system and the skin and, uh, prevents penetration of uh, unwanted organisms into the body. And then if they do happen to get into the body in some way, we've got an immune system that fights infection and uh, tries to get rid of inflammation that occurs when an organ or tissue is damaged. Um, so you can see that uh, we have these different components of the systems. They all do different jobs, but if, if one or more of them breaks down, then the whole system starts to become affected. Finally, we have movement, okay? Movement, that's very important. And we have, we have bones, we have muscles, joints, and tendons to move. And the bones not only um, basically are used by the muscles, joints, and tendons to move the body, but it also, the bones also define what kind of movements we can make. Um, I cannot bend backward and put my head through my knees uh, like some people who uh, are have special flexible joints and are can do those kinds of movements. So my skeletal system defines the limits of my movement. Um, the, the bones and the skeleton also shape the body. You don't think about that very often, do you? These are the things that keep me up at night. Um, Here's just a very simple version of the brain system. And the brain system is broken down into fundamental units called columns. And they are literally columns. And this is on the surface of the brain. And these are very tiny. Um, they're only 50 microns by 50 microns in cross-sectional area. And they're three millimeters deep. And each of these columns has about 50 to 100 nerve cells in them. 
each of these columns will respond to only one thing, nothing else. Like, um, for example, uh, let's say when the information comes in and you see a, this, this black and red and white uh, bird, okay, that information flows from the bird through our eyes to the back of the brain where there are columns that only detect a color like red. And so you got some columns that detect red, some columns detect white, some detect black. And then we've got other columns that detect outlines. So you start to see the shape of what you're looking at. And then these columns, they integrate that information and then they send it forward both to the lower part of the brain called the temporal lobe and the higher part called the parietal lobe. And the lower part allows you to recognize the object and the upper part allows you to see where it is and to track its movement. Now, these two visual systems then come together into the frontal lobe so that you can integrate seeing the bird, seeing it fly away, seeing where it is on a tree. And this is the basic process by which information that comes into the brain gets broken down into little pieces and processed by these columns and then put back together and sent forward to the front of the brain to be integrated with all the other information that is coming in. And that is really the basic way the brain work system works. So now let's shift. Now that we've kind of seen what systems are like and um, basically uh, that they depend upon each other and they do different jobs, let's see what causes a brain system to dysfunction. Well, we know from uh, studies by individuals like Montine up in Seattle, that if you take normal aging individuals and you measure their memory uh, every year until they die, and then do a brain autopsy, you will find that they will have a certain amount of misfolded proteins. And the height of these red, blue, and green bars tells you the amount of misfolded protein in each individual. Now they looked at only three types of disease with different types of misfolded proteins in each disease. They looked at stroke, they looked at Parkinson's disease, and they looked at Alzheimer's. The blue bars are the Alzheimer's, the red bars are vascular disease or stroke, and the green bars are Parkinson's disease. And each of these have different misfolded proteins. And you can see that some individuals actually have not only just uh, Alzheimer's misfolded proteins, but they also have Parkinson's misfolded proteins. And some of the more unfortunate ones have not only Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, but uh, vascular or stroke misfolded proteins. Now, the amazing thing is that 98% uh, of these, nor these individuals were all cognitively and functionally normal the year they died. And yet 98% of them had these misfolded proteins in their brain. So uh, for some reason, they were still functioning normally. Well, the difference from this group and the group that the year they died uh, they were not functioning normally. They had cognitive impairment or dementia. And uh, cognitive impairment is a milder version of dementia. Dementia is much more severe. Uh, dementia means that you're losing the ability to know how to do things you've done your entire, for many, many years. Like, uh, for example, I can play tennis. I play classical guitar. Uh, I study math. I know a little medicine. And if I forgot how to play tennis or how to play guitar, uh, or if I manage my finances, which I don't because I'm terrible at that, 
Um, if I forgot how to do that, that's dementia, well-learned skills lost. But if, if what I'm doing is forgetting like when to go to the doctor or uh, when to take my medicine, that's cognitive impairment, that's not dementia, okay? So memory-related problems are not dementia, they are cognitive impairment, which is a much milder stage. So what you see is that, yes, these individuals also had uh, the misfolded proteins, but they had on the average three times as much. So this leads to the basic um, solution of preventing brain dysfunction. We need to keep the misfolded proteins from accumulating beyond some threshold at which symptoms develop. And there are solutions to doing that. So uh, we will get into that, but I wanted to show you next what these misfolded proteins, how these misfolded proteins occur. Uh, you'll see in the upper left-hand corner uh, something that says unfolded. Well, that's a protein that has not yet been folded to perform its job, okay? Well, there's a very complex machinery in every cell in your body designed to fold proteins because once they're folded, that allows them to perform their function, okay? Now, if they're folded properly, as shown by the green arrow going down, then they can perform their function. But if anything causes them to misfold, we have one set of defenses that tries to detect that misfolding and prevent it. I'm not showing that system here right now. I'm showing the system uh, that if a misfolded protein does develop, which is shown in the purple rectangle in the middle of the screen, and those MPs that you see uh, above the black arrow stand for misfolded protein. So that's what a misfolded protein looks like. And when that occurs, these misfolded proteins, they attach down at the bottom where the black arrow is going to the cell membrane. And your cell membrane is like a, a very sophisticated computer. It's got all sorts of elements in it and they do all sorts of different things. And it's really the uh, brains of all cells is their membranes. Well, these misfolded proteins, they just love to anchor into the membrane. And wherever they anchor, they damage the function of that part of the membrane. They can literally punch holes into membranes. Well, that's not good for a nerve cell because nerve cells function by having a, 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 a difference between the concentration of sodium outside a nerve cell and inside a nerve cell. So that when a nerve cell generates an electrical signal, there's this massive influx of sodium into the nerve cell and that generates the electrical signal. And that allows it to communicate with all the nerve cells it's connected to. That's normal function. So if these too many of these misfolded proteins accumulate in a nerve cell, they punch too many holes and they allow too much leakage. So there's no longer a difference in the sodium amount inside and outside. And the nerve cell stops firing a signal. And then it becomes of no use because it's communicating with 20,000 other neurons. Every neuron communicates with 20,000 other neurons. So you don't want to lose your neurons and you don't want to lose your connections between your neurons. So the, uh, the cells have three defense mechanisms against misfolded proteins once they've formed, three ways to remove them. And what you're seeing in uh, the pharmaceutical industry are uh, 
are treatments or drugs or medications that use one of these ways of removing misfolded proteins. The one that's been used the most heavily so far is the use of antibodies that bind to a particular misfolded protein, but don't bind to all the different types of misfolded proteins that occur with different diseases. And um, so that is one way that you can get rid of them. And you see on the far right of the screen, uh, the uh, kind of the black ellipses with a little AB, AB. Those are the antibodies that bind to the misfolded protein. And then they get ushered out of the cell uh, and eliminated from the brain and then ultimately excreted in the kidneys and the urine. You also have a system uh, that is called autophagy. Uh, auto meaning self, phagy meaning eating. And it literally will take a misfolded protein and it eats it and it cuts it up into its fundamental components, which are amino acids. And then those amino acids are reprocessed and a new protein is folded and created. A third mechanism, by the way, there, there, is a, uh, uh, there is a clinical trial, I don't think it's in phase three yet, but that uses precisely this mechanism. The third mechanism is uh, called uh, proteasome. And proteasomes are little uh, cylinders. And you can see underneath the term proteasome, a little kind of uh, cylindrical object with an, a black arrow going through it. What happens there is it takes uh, misfolded proteins that have a certain uh, width or diameter, and if they fit into that hole in the cylinder, then they pass through there, and as they pass through there, it literally straightens the misfolding out, and it allows it to be refolded. Uh, so there are actually two medications that are very exciting. One is called LMTM, and it's very near the completion of its FDA phase three trial. It's extremely effective at removing tangles. And that's important because the tangles are a certain type of misfolded protein that... Um, are one of the dominant reasons for progression of Alzheimer's and any other conditions that they are found in. Um, so the ability to get rid of tangles can have a tremendous impact on not only preventing symptoms from developing, but also uh, either stopping the progression of a person who already has systems and even partially reversing the dysfunction. So uh, LMTM is uh, exciting and it's probably going to be the first uh, uh, treatment that if it gets approved by the FDA will be a tremendous advance in our toolbox to be able to treat these misfolded proteins. Uh, another another uh, proteasome treatment that's very exciting, just entered phase three. It's by a company called Cassaba Sciences, C-A-S-S-A-B-A. -S -S and uh, they've created a small molecule called simophilum, kind of like, sounds like penicillin, but it's called simophilum, S-I-M-U-F- I L A M. And simophilum works in a different way, but it also functions like a proteasome. Uh, it has the ability to restructure the skeleton of a cell so that it doesn't allow uh, what's the amyloid misfolded protein to cause damage. And it also helps prevent the formation of the tangle proteins. So <clears throat> now we're going to move into the 
prevention practum, practicum basics. And what we've been talking about so far is, uh, first of all, an understanding of what systems are, because that's useful for preventing system dysfunction, which is the brain and the body. Now let's look at the things that cause misfolded proteins to form. And the, we call these risk factors. So the first thing you need to do is identify risk factors. And then the next thing is annually monitor them and see if they're well controlled. If they are, they just keep getting annually monitored, like getting your cholesterol checked each year and your blood pressure. Um, if they're not well controlled, then they cause the accumulation of misfolded proteins. So, and it doesn't matter which disease you're talking about, virtually all chronic diseases produce increases in misfolded proteins if they are not well controlled. So let's look at that. These are um, the most common uh, conditions which have been shown to increase misfolded proteins in animal models. And uh, I want you to, uh, if you've got a sheet of paper, maybe two sheets, because after this, we're going to take a memory test. And uh, just so you get used to the idea of taking a memory test, because that's essential to preventing uh, brain dysfunction. Uh, but write down all of your existing medical conditions and indicate on a scale of one to 10, how well controlled are they? Where one is they're not controlled at all, and 10 is they're very well controlled. So let's, uh, I'll just go through these and it might trigger uh, recall of a particular condition that you hadn't thought was a risk factor. Uh, we have uh, high cholesterol, LDL, low HDL cholesterol, VLDL triglycerides. We have stroke, even mini strokes and so-called TIAs, they count. All forms of heart disease, any form of heart disease, valve dysfunction, atrial fibrillation, coronary artery disease, um, heart attacks, called MIs, blood pressure. Not only does high blood pressure cause the accumulation of misfolded proteins, low blood pressure also does. And the older you get, the stiffer your vessels, your blood vessels become so that you actually need a higher pressure as you get older in order to deliver the fuel from the blood to all your organs. A typical, uh, if let's say you, your blood pressure has been 120 over 80 all your life, well, if it drops to, let's say, 100 over 60, then you're not delivering enough blood to your organs and brain, and that causes problems. Diabetes is a very common and uh, cause of an increased misfolded protein production that affects the brain. Uh, obesity is another one. Uh, cancer, either cancer itself or certainly uh, some of the chemotherapy agents that cause uh, so-called chemo fog. Um, certain medications that uh, block the functioning of the brain, such as tranquilizers and uh, antipsychotic medications, even some uh, bladder incontinence agents can block uh, the normal function of the brain. Um, chronic stress, uh, that's something that's very common in the United States. That actually can uh, punch little holes in the brain, particularly in the short-term memory area called the hippocampus. Chronic stress leads to cell death due to a marked increase in cortisol. So chronic stress is another issue. Post-traumatic stress disorder would be a good example as well. Untreated depression uh, is something that shuts the brain down, reduces its activity, 
and causes tissue loss that looks identical to Alzheimer's disease. Uh, sleep quality, uh, less than seven to eight hours a night or more than eight hours uh, is a, a sign of poor, um, uh, poor waste elimination from the brain. The brain uses what's called slow wave sleep to get rid of all the toxins that have accumulated in the brain. So if you're getting a reduced uh, sleep time, then uh, you're getting an accumulation of these misfolded proteins, and that's a risk factor. Now, uh, other things, uh, estrogen deficiency used to be, uh, well, estrogen deficiency is a cause of cognitive impairment. And uh, if you replace estrogen with hormone replacement therapy within five years of, um, of menopause, then the overall risk of dying decreases by 15% over the next 20 years. Uh, it also has been shown, in fact, uh, I published a study of 100,000 women uh, from the National Mortality Survey and women who had a hysterectomy in the old days before they replaced with estrogen, they were twice as likely to become demented. Uh, that, that has been validated in many, many studies. So if you replace estrogen within five years of menopause, then you get risk reduction for many causes of death uh, with almost no increase in risk of any other condition. Um, low education could be also uh, replaced by the term uh, lack of lifelong learning. So it's not just about what you did when you went to school, it's what you do now. And that is like physical exercise for the muscles. Uh, lifelong learning is the, is the physical exercise for the brain that makes it grow and grows new connections and keeps it healthy. Head trauma, um, that damages specific areas and sometimes it can actually turn on a degenerative brain disease. You, we've seen that uh, with many of the NFL football players. Uh, there are some other less common conditions that I won't go through. And uh, we have previously talked about diet, physical exercise, brain exercise, and alcohol consumption. Um, in general, the, 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 um, the advice is uh, alcohol in modest amounts is not harmful and it is potentially helpful. Uh, modest being uh, up to two drinks a day in the, fifth, up in the 50 year olds or midlife. And when you get to around 70, that needs to drop to about one drink a day in order to uh, avoid actually shutting the brain down too much and uh, benefit from any effects of re reduced anxiety and reduced stress with alcohol. So uh, now Parkinson's disease produces a different misfolded protein. It has fewer identified risk factors, but one of the interesting ones is uh, cleaning agents. So trichloroethylene is a common cleaning agent. And uh, as you know, in the uh, San Joaquin Valley, uh, there's a very, it's almost like an epidemic of Parkinson's and it's believed to be related to pesticide exposure in the San Joaquin Valley. It turns out that alcohol smoking and caffeine consumption reduce the risk of developing Parkinson's. Um, this is just additional evidence uh, got, taken from exactly identical twins. And if you look at when they developed Alzheimer's disease, 13% uh, of the identical twins from a national Swedish registry showed a difference in the age of onset of up to 15 years. And so those are two genetically identical people differed in their age of onset of Alzheimer's by 15 years or less. So it can't be genetics, it has to be behavior. And um, 
this is just an example of uh, lifelong learning. And if it's sometimes I find it's hard to ask about how much cognitive exercise you do. That doesn't sound like an easy one to translate, but there was a study that translated it into a useful way of uh, answering. And so typical cognitive activities include reading books and newspapers, writing letters or emails, going to the library, playing games of skill and strategy. And um, those are examples. And I think you can take it from there. Uh, and the level, the levels of cognitive activity are what you really want to know. So high would be considered daily to weekly cognitive uh, activities of this type. Uh, a middle level of activity would be weekly to monthly and low would be less than monthly. So uh, on your sheet of paper, write down whether you're in the high, middle or low category. Um, now, what this shows is that the individuals who are in the high level of cognitive activity, they had levels of a misfolded protein called amyloid, the first one to accumulate in Alzheimer's, that were the same as 20 year olds. And these were all individuals 65 years and older. And they, the people with high cognitive activity had levels of that misfolded protein that were the same as 20 year olds. People who had uh, uh, low levels of cognitive activity had levels of amyloid in their brain that were the same as people who had dementia due to Alzheimer's. So this was a very nice study to show how cognitive exercise can actually um, uh, influence the amount of misfolded protein in the brain. This is uh, just a reinforcement of sleep quality. So here's another one you want to write down. Uh, the way they assess sleep quality uh, was to um, examine, ask the questions, when you wake up in the morning, and you might as well write down your answers on a scale of one to 10, do you feel refreshed? Okay, and then during the day, uh, how much daytime drowsiness or napping do you have? Again, one is uh, a lot or um, uh, 10 would be, you know, I'm not drowsy in the day, I don't nap. And if I feel refreshed, I'm 10. And if I'm not refreshed at all, I'm terrible when I wake up, I'm a one. And they asked those questions and then they measured the amount of that misfolded protein amyloid. And what they found in, this was in the spinal fluid, uh, they found that sleep deprivation reduces the removal of amyloid, and it impairs uh, the ability of slow wave sleep to detoxify the brain. And um, <clears throat> it impairs the ability to consolidate memory. You, you basically run through your memories of the day when you're sleeping, and it impairs feeling refreshed in the morning. Uh, daytime drowsiness that increased um, a, a compound that's naturally produced. And uh, <clears throat> this uh, promotes wake wakefulness. It's called orexin. And there is a, a drug or a medication called suvorexin or belsomra, which is the only medication at this point that can mimic the normal sleep wake cycles. Uh, so people who had daytime drowsiness, uh, they had uh, low levels of orexin. And so uh, the sleeping in the daytime increased it to wake them up. Uh, and those people with daytime drowsiness and napping, they had higher levels of tangles in their brain. And then finally, uh, sleep deprivation they looked at inflammation in the brain with another uh, spinal fluid measure. 
and sleep deprivation increased inflammation in the brain, which also interferes with the portion of sleep that removes the toxins called slow wave sleep. Well, here's another one. This is a lifestyle uh, uh, study. And in this case, they were actually looking at people who already had symptoms. But what they have found is these results are identical in people who are functioning normally. These are risk factors uh, if they're not for certain types of lifestyles. So they looked at the management of uh, like blood, blood measures that you stand, standardly get like chemistry panels, things like that. They did uh, some counseling uh, for nutrition and they did some exercise training, physical, and then some group cognitive exercise training. And they found that this was done in Finland. Uh, the compliance over two years was 85 to 100%. So people did not have trouble doing this uh, once they got the right knowledge. And if you look at memory, the group in the red line were the people who uh, did uh, engaged in these lifestyle uh, positive behaviors and the blue line were people who did not. This did not reach a significant uh, difference, but there was a trend here. However, in terms of the processing speed in the brain, there was a marked benefit of these lifestyle factors. In terms of executive function, which is what we all do to solve problems, uh, make decisions, analyze issues, marked improvement in people who engaged in these uh, lifestyle behaviors. And uh, overall measures of cognition also very significant uh, improvement in the people who engaged in these lifestyle factors. So on your sheet of paper, um, I haven't gone into the details and, and uh, those details are you know, very, very well known. But you know, if you ask on a scale of one to 10, how your diet is, you eat a lot of butter, cheese, ice cream, saturated fat, that's pushing you to the one. Uh, if you eat a lot of chicken, fish, vegetables, um, fruits, uh, olive oil, olive oil is huge. Uh, and you don't eat a lot of red meat, okay, uh, or other meats with saturated fat, then that's, that's pushing you towards the tent. Uh, nuts as well, beneficial. Uh, if you look at physical exercise, the general findings are that four days a week for 45 minutes or longer, where you get a little short of breath or sweaty, that's kind of the, the key marker, that's sufficient to get a benefit to the brain and body. And uh, the cognitive exercise, well, you already saw uh, the low, middle, and high levels of activity for cognitive exercise. So uh, interestingly also, the group that engaged in these lifestyle positive behaviors, they were 31% less likely to show decline over two years of the study. Um, I've shown this many times and the only point of this is that if you measure memory when before a medical condition is controlled and after it's controlled, there's always an improvement in memory. And I just picked a sample of subjects from the Vital Brain Aging Program to just represent different chronic conditions that definitely show an improved memory score, which is the more uh, uh, bold colored bars compared to the paler colored bars which was before they um, adjusted their medical condition so that it was better controlled. So all of these, uh, you know, things like lupus, blood pressure, insomnia, atrial fibrillation, fatigue, depression, stress, 
obesity, inactive physical life, they all affect memory and cognition. So now let's move to the second aspect. And this is the one that I think people are afraid of. They're afraid, you know, I used to hear all the time, oh, I'd be afraid to check my memory. I wouldn't want to find out if there was anything wrong. Well, those are the people who become demented, to be quite frank, okay? If you annually monitor your memory and cognition and function, you can identify either while you're functioning completely normally or when there's just a mild difficulty. And that allows you to diagnose all the causes and then treat them. And all of them, I, well, I won't say all, but 90 plus percent of all causes of cognitive impairment and brain dysfunction are treatable, including Alzheimer's disease. These are just misfolded proteins. Parkinson's, just misfolded proteins. We have ways of removing those misfolded proteins now. It's not that complicated. So monitoring cognition and function annually is critical to preventing brain dysfunction and preventing becoming dependent. So let's look at uh, now, I know this is the moment I've been waiting for, and this is the moment you probably have not been waiting for. I am gonna test your memory. And I, uh, I'll just ask you to get a blank sheet of paper and, um, oh, you can't see me, so. Take your blank sheet of paper and just keep it available and get yourself something to write with. And what we're gonna do now is uh, the most sensitive memory test there is. Uh, it's 97% accurate for separating the symptomatic stages of cognitive impairment from normal functioning stages, even when there's a brain disease. And uh, just to give you a little preparation, I'm going to read you a list of 10 words. And with each word, I'm gonna ask you to repeat it out loud. I know I won't be able to hear you, but please do this so that we do the test properly. At the end of the 10 words, I'm gonna ask you to write down as many of the words as you can remember, and then fold the paper so you can't see those words. We're gonna do this three times, and then we'll do something to intervene for a few minutes, and then I'm gonna test your ability to remember those 10 words, okay? I hope you all have your sheet of paper and a pen or a pencil, and here we go. Okay, the first word is butter, say butter. Say arm, shore, letter, queen, cabin, pole, ticket, grass, engine. Now write down as many of these words as you can remember. And I'll do the, um, the Jeopardy song while we're during this interval. Da, 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 da. This is why I did not go into a singing career. Now fold the paper so you can't see the words you wrote down. Okay. Here we go. I'm going to give you another. We're going to go through these words again. Again, say them out loud. And at the end of the list, I'm going to ask you 
So again, write down as many of the words as you can remember. Here we go. Butter, arm, shore, letter, queen, cabin, pole, ticket, grass, engine. Write down as many of these words as you can remember. I won't do the Jeopardy song again. But if you'd like to hear fan of the opera, I can do that. Okay, I hope uh, everybody is done. We are going to do this one more time. Now fold the paper so you can't see the words. No cheating. You want to fold that paper so you can't see the words you wrote down. Now here we go. Butter. Arm. Shore. Letter. Queen. Cabin. Pole. Ticket. Grass. Engine. Write down as many of these words as you can remember. Okay, when you're done, I want you to fold the paper one more time so you can't see the words that you wrote down. Now, I'd like you to write down how many of the 10 words you think you'll be able to remember in a few minutes. So make a prediction, write down from zero to 10 how many words you think you will remember in a few minutes. Now, we're going to do a different task, and most people think this is a very strange one. Uh, I'm not going to tell you why we do it, but I can tell you that this is developed by a very famous anthropologist, and it works for every culture on the planet. So now I'm gonna ask you, which animal is most different from the other two? And um, you can, uh, why don't you write, you can write this down or you can simply decide. That either way is okay. Dog, lion, or tiger? Which one is most different from the other two? And I don't care how you decide what's different. Just make your mind up. Doesn't matter how you decide what's most, which animal's most different. Okay, here we go. Which animal is most different from the other two? Goat, rat, or cow? Which animal is most different from the other two? Monkey, zebra, or elephant? Which animal is most different from the other two? Cow, zebra, or elephant? Which animal is most different from the other two? Goat, monkey, 
or rat? That's a tough one. Which animal is most different from the other two? Rat, tiger, or elephant? Which animal is most different from the other two? Zebra, dog, or lion? Which animal is most different from the other two? Goat, cow, or rat? Which animal is most different from the other two? Elephant, tiger, or monkey? Which animal is most different from the other two? Monkey, lion, or dog? Which animal is most different from the other two? Goat, lion, or cow? Which animal is most different from the other two? Zebra, dog, or tiger? Now, I'd like you to write down as many of the 10 words that you learned a few minutes ago Write down as many of them as you can remember. Okay, I hope you've had enough time. Now, these were the 10 words that you learned. Butter, arm, shore, letter, queen, cabin, pole, ticket, grass, and engine. Write down as many, how many words you correctly recall. Also, write down how many words you recalled that were not on the list. And just as a rough guideline, and this is not, you know, it's not fair to, to, to use this as a, a valid measure at this point. I just want you to be familiar with the process of testing memory. Recalling seven or more out of 10 is typical of norm normal aging, but we have much more advanced methods of analyzing your responses that get that 97% accuracy. Now, I want you to write down as many as you can remember of the animals you compared. Okay. These were the, uh, the nine animals you compared. Write down as many 
of the animals that you correctly recalled and the other animals you recalled that were not on this list. Recalling uh, seven or more out of animals out of nine is typical in normal aging. This is the process that we can use to separate out three different memory systems that are affected by different conditions. And that allows us to be able to be 97% accurate at knowing whether there is a normal aging process going on or whether something in addition to normal aging is occurring. So to summarize, uh, the prevention practicum will allow you to identify your risk factors, annually monitor them, determine if they are well controlled, that's something you want to do with your doctor, your treating physician. And if we find that risk factors are not well controlled, go back and see if they can be better controlled. We often find, by the way, such as in diabetes, that even though the, the standard diabetes measures say everything's hunky-dory, we find that cognition may be affected and that tightening the diabetes control results in improved cognition. So the cognitive measure, the memory testing sometimes is a very good measure of how well your existing conditions are controlled. And uh, by annually monitoring your cognition and function, that can be done through uh, the Orange County Vital Brain Age Pro Aging Program, through the Shankel Clinic, um, that allows you to be sure whether you're aging nor normally, at least your brain. And if not, then we proceed with diagnosing the causes, treating them, and then we reassess uh, your function, your memory. And if it's back to normal, that's great. And we continue monitoring annually. If it's not back to normal, we're going to reassess the causes and see if we've missed something or if something's not well controlled. And uh, we repeat that process until we're sure that all the risk factors that we can modify are modified and well controlled. And this uh, almost always results in better brain function, whether there's symptoms or not. So, uh, I will stop there, and uh, I apologize I've gone way over time. I've gone an hour and 15 minutes, but I'll be happy to answer any questions. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Schenkel. Sure. Um, given that we have gone a little bit long, uh, and I think we're losing a few people here, but we'll um, maybe the best bet is to take one or two questions and to follow up with Uh, given some recent news, I think there are several audience members who are uh, curious about your thoughts on Biogen's aducanumab, which was just uh, approved by the FDA for use. Um, so kind of what you think about the FDA's decision there and also, um, you know, your thoughts on the, the drug itself and its, and its use. Um, so the, I think they're, call it, the brand name is called Aduel or something like that. Right. And uh, this, this is a, an antibody that binds to a toxic form of amyloid. And the study showed that in persons who just have amyloid and it's causing some problems in memory, that if you give that treatment, you can essentially stop the formation of the tangles uh, because the tangles are partly at least a result of the formation of amyloid. Now, if you take another situation where you have a person with both amyloid and tangles, okay, well, giving the aducanumab or aduwell 
will reduce the level of amyloid by about 50%, but the tangles that are already in the brain will continue to spread from neuron to neuron to neuron. It spreads through the connections of neurons. So that process will not be stopped. And uh, it is the tangles that largely produces the progression of brain dysfunction in conditions that produce tangles. So this includes uh, vascular disease, stroke, mini stroke, uh, reduced blood flow situations. Um, it includes uh, uh, Parkinson's disease in many cases, Lewy body disease. It includes frontal temporal lobe diseases, which are a little less common, but are very, uh, very uh, uh, discouraging. Um, so if you only have amyloid, that looks like a very useful treatment. But if you have tangles or other misfolded proteins in addition, it's not going to stop the progression of them. So that's one factor to consider. And then you can ask, well, how do I know if I have amyloid or tangles or other misfolded proteins? The answer at present is that we do it with cerebral spinal fluid, a spinal tap. And people go, ah, a spinal tap. No, no, no. But a spinal tap, if it's done properly, we set up a protocol where we've done over 800 people now. Only nine people have had pain and eight of those nine had spinal stenosis, which means there's a crowding of the nerves in the low back. And so it makes it hard to put the needle into the spinal fluid and not hit a nerve. That's why we use a blunted needle so that if it does hit a nerve, it pushes on it and it doesn't cut it. Uh, we also use an X-ray so we can actually see where the needle goes and it avoids pain sensitive structures. So we can make a spinal tap uh, painless in 99% of people. Um, it takes about 10 minutes, and, but it gives us the answer we need to know. Do we just have amyloid or maybe we just have tangles, in which case there's no point in using aducanumab. Uh, the ideal patient is gonna have just amyloid. And just to give you an idea, in the Shankel Clinic, 25% of the people who come in only have amyloid. So they've come in very early. They may still be functioning normally, but have noticed a decline in their memory where they have to take more notes or you know, use more uh, reminder systems, uh, but they can still do it on their own. They can compensate on their own. Those individuals often have just amyloid in their brain and Aduel or aducanumab could be a very good solution. Now, it is not a risk-free treatment. 40% um, of people who took aducanumab in the clinical trials had uh, what's called Alzheimer-related imaging, or no, amyloid-related imaging abnormalities. What is that? That is a leakage of blood into the brain. Um, some might say that's a hemorrhage. Uh, it could also be a fluid, okay, from the blood called edema. And the, uh, the range of, uh, of uh, severity of these 40% of people who got uh, this condition um, was from no symptoms at all to severe, uh, severe dysfunction. Um, the company Biogen claims that uh, there were no deaths due to uh, the, the hemorrhage in the brain. Uh, I, I don't know uh, because they did their analyses of the cause of death in people who died during the clinical trials and their claim was that it uh, was not due to the medication. 
The other factor that you need to consider is they currently are charging approximately $5,000 a month for treatment with aducanumab. And this drug is given intravenously through the blood vessel. Um, that means it has to cross from the blood into the brain. And we know from um, many studies that only one-tenth of 1% 1 of those antibodies cross from the blood into the brain. So it's not a very good, you know, it's not very good numbers. You'd like to see a lot higher percentage entry. And it may also be that the antibodies bind may bind to amyloid in the blood vessels, and that may be why they create leaks and cause these tiny little hemorrhages or brain swelling. Um, it is a reversible condition if it occurs in many cases, um, but it, you should be very aware that that is a real risk. Now, um, I should probably tell you that I have been using um, antibodies that have, they don't have the same properties as aducanumab, but I have been using them uh, by inhaling them through the nose in about 100 patients. And uh, I've treated approximately 10 different degenerative brain diseases. Virtually every single degenerative brain disease has individuals that have used this treatment and shown a positive improvement. Not everybody, but at least 50 to 70% of patients have shown improvement and then stabilization or substantially delayed decline. Um, one potential advantage of that approach, which I'm hopefully going to be able to explore is uh, the use of aducanumab by inhaling it through the nose. And the reasons are twofold. One is that my best clinical estimate is that it probably gets into the brain 15 to 30 times better by inhaling it through the nose than it does by injecting it into the blood. And that means you need a, need a much lower dose. The second reason, which is maybe even more important, is that to date, in six years of treating 100 patients, I've had zero patients who've had this amyloid-related imaging abnormality. And part of that is because the doses are 15 to 30 times lower, which reduces the cost, by the way, from about $5,000 a month to potentially $200 to $300 a month. Uh, but there is no blood-brain barrier between the nose and the brain. The barrier between the nose and the brain um, is uh, different. And so because we've been able to use a much lower dose of these antibodies uh, and we don't have to deal with a blood-brain barrier, uh, that may explain why we haven't had any cases of amyloid-related imaging abnormalities, which um, can be very severe. So my preference, if I'm legally allowed to do so, would be to use um, the uh, aducanumab uh, intranasally. And I've uh, strongly encouraged Biogen to do a fair trial comparing intravenous to intranasal delivery uh, not only because of cost, but a potential reduced risk of hemorrhage and uh, comparable efficacy. So that, that's, I think this is a useful uh, tool in my toolbox. I intend to use it, and I will be frank about uh, the potential pros and cons and uh, the potential pros and cons of using it int uh, intravenously versus intranasally. Great, very helpful uh, and thorough. Uh, we'll, we'll all have to stay tuned on uh, kind of your use and uh, more information that comes out from the FDA.
so I think given that we've run a little over, we will take the rest of the questions offline, but uh, thank you so much for, for your lecture and for uh, addressing that question and, and getting our brains working a little bit with your test. Um, and uh, we'll look forward to the next webinar. Oh, uh, Connor, uh, how can people access this recording? That's a great question. So uh, in the next week or so, this will be posted to the Shankle Clinic website, www.shankleclinic.com. And it will also be on the Shankle Clinic's YouTube page. Uh, so if you do not subscribe to the Shankle Clinic YouTube channel, uh, I highly suggest you do. If you go to youtube.com and search Shankle Clinic, uh, our channel will appear where you'll find uh, all of our webinar recordings. Um, so, so look there in the next uh, week or so. Well, thank you all for spending the time with me tonight. And um, I, I, I hope it's been helpful. Great. Have a great night. Thank you all. Good night.